welcome, friends, to Casseroles and Tacos podcast. I am Katie, the Casseroles half of the team. And I'm Andrea, always cooking tacos, but not so much lately, but a little bit. It's just pretty hot, folks. It's pretty hot. Um, Today I made burritos, which is not exactly the same. But definitely uh, cooking up the tacos usually around here, trying to stay cool. We had sandwiches tonight, friends, Mm -hmm. because it's just 107 degrees and not Mm -hmm. happening. But plenty of good taco recipes in my arsenal, just not really using them. But we're happy you're here. We're happy you joined us. Um, I hope you guys are staying cool out there. I know it's hot all over the place. And uh, we hope that you've got a minute just to come sit down with us with a nice cold beverage and get out of the heat for a little bit. We're happy you're here. We're thankful that you'll come back and join us. And, um, you know, Katie, I was really interested in, to see and hear how much uh, feedback people had about our heritage or our um, kitchen legacy conversation. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple episodes ago talking about, you know, the legacy others have left or the legacy we hope to leave or how legacy can be built in the kitchen. And uh, so it's really fun for me to have these different episodes with Katie and and talk to you guys and share our stories in our lives and also hear what's going on in yours and what matters to you. So I think Katie, I would agree with me that that's one of the best things about this podcast is that we get to interact and, and you share your lives with us too. So with that being said, I want to jump right into something that Katie and I were just talking about, which is um, something that uh, someone had submitted for us. And we told you guys that we would love to hear your stories about um, kitchen legacies that have impacted you or Mm -hmm. your thoughts on kitchen legacy. And um, I don't want to miss anything in this episode. So we're going to jump right into it, Katie. I want to know all about this um, kitchen legacy testimony of sorts that you have in your hands there. Yes, I do have an email sent to me by a childhood friend. And um, now I'm just going to tell you, uh, we want to hear all of your uh, kitchen legacy stories. And we encourage you to send those in to us. And, um, you know, casseroles and tacos. Well, Andrea can tell us (laughs) the email. Is it casseroles-and-tacos.com? I think. (laughs) All right. Casseroles and tacos and at gmail.com. It. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Ooh, help me. Okay. <laughs> you can send that in. Uh, but my friend sent this to my personal email because she, um, like I said, she's a childhood friend. So this kitchen legacy is dear to my heart as well because I know exactly who she's talking about. And I have enjoyed and appreciated hospitality in this dear lady's home during my childhood. So I'm going to jump right in, Andrea, and I'm going to read uh, the email sent to me by my friend, Susan Cook Ragsdale. Awesome. She says, my grandma Claire was affectionately known as grandma by all the kids that came after me. I'm the oldest grandchild of my generation. So the names I could say and gave my grandparents are the ones that carried through to the rest of the grandkids and still continue in reference to this day. Grandma and Papa. Grandma was the matriarch. She was the glue and she was the mother. She kept us all in line when I ran under the bed trying to get away from punishment, rolling from side to side as she kept trying to get to me. I eventually came out to face whatever punishment was due me. She did it all in love and even then I knew that. On a side note, that is the very bed we sleep in to this day. When it came time for family meals together, Grandma was always the hostess, even with her own family. She wouldn't sit down till everyone was taken care of. My job eventually as eldest grandchild was to bring in the rolls from the kitchen in the metal bun warmer after everyone's plate was filled. But I couldn't do that until Grandma sat down. I remember often telling her to sit, please, so I could go get the rolls. I still have that faded vintage bun warmer, and it's one of my prized possessions. Those rolls were the staple of her meals. They were famous. They were the rolls that foods were, food dreams are made of. She would take them to church potlucks and to funeral homes. She would make them and freeze them for meals throughout the week. I could go to Grandma's house anytime and get a roll with ham, with butter, with jelly. Whenever and however I wanted one, one would be made available. I miss her rolls. I miss my grandma so much it hurts every time I think of her now. She was my anchor, my confidant, and my friend. She taught me piano. She taught me to sing alto in church and to read music, but also to hear and feel it. Now I teach my own daughter. 
She was above all a Christian, but being a mother and grandmother just came naturally to her. She never lived to see any great-grandchildren, but she knew they were in her family's future, and she would have loved spending time with every one of them. I don't get to make her roles as often as I would like. Life gets in the way and time slips by. But when I do, memories of Grandma Claire flood into my heart and mind. And the smells of her kitchen bring back all those memories, just as clearly as if I were walking into her home today. Wow. Well, I'm going to tell you, friends, I remember Claire, Miss Claire, we would call her. She, her husband, Brother Griffin, we called him Brother Griffin and Miss Claire. And um, he was an elder in the church where my daddy preached and just... um country church, and I, I'm not going to, uh, probably less than 100, maybe a little more than 100, I don't know, but um, Brother Griffin was just one of the dear uh, gentlemen and uh, in the church, and he, I remember, well, he and I shared a birthday, August 15th, and every um birthday on on our birthdays or around about I would make him um I think it was called a Georgia special orange cake and it it wasn't anything necessarily not a family recipe it was just a, a an orange a cake with cake mix and added mandarin oranges and so forth and uh it was just one that I had made him and then he you know acted like he liked it and I made it for him every year until I married and and left that little country church and um, he was just one of the special people. They both were special people to our family. And, um, well, the extended, um, you know, their whole extended family was um, special to us. Um, he owned a um, electrical supply and he helped with... Um, you know, the, the electrical supplies that my daddy needed to refinish the house and, and restore the old 1830s home. And uh, he was just really good to us. Well, Miss Claire's food was delicious, but those rolls were amazing. So, Andrea, I have the recipe for those rolls <clears throat> that I would like to oh, share. Wonderful. And maybe... Um, our friends could pull out their casseroles and tacos cookbook that they've started <laughs> writing in and they could add this. So I will I tell you Grandma Claire's rolls. Now they're called Grandma Claire's All Brand Refrigerator Rolls. I did not know until just about, well, three weeks ago that they had All Brand in them because Susan and I had, uh, we had an opportunity to meet after many years of not uh, seeing each other. And she told me that. So here is the recipe, my friends. Two packages dry yeast, one cup water, three-fourths cup sugar, one cup all-brand cereal, one cup shortening, melted, and then cooled to 110 degrees, two eggs, one and a half teaspoon salt, six cups all-purpose flour. Now, my friends, I will write this um, I will try to find us a picture. I will see if Susan can send me a picture of Grandma Claire. And we will we'll post that on our Casseroles and Tacos Instagram page. And I will, I'll put this recipe down below that. But if you're writing it down now and you want to try it before I get that posted. It says proof yeast and water and sugar for 10 minutes. Add the all bran and let it set until the cereal is soft. Now, if you don't know what all bran is, by the way, it is... Um, if you're not familiar with buying that, it is a cereal, and it's just called All Brand. I think it's Kellogg's, maybe. I'm not sure. But that's the name of it. <clears throat> Add the rest of the wet ingredients and mix well. Add the dry ingredients until well mixed to form a dough. Cover and refrigerate overnight. Set out for three to four hours to let the dough come to room temperature and then double in size. Roll out and form rolls into balls. Let them double in size again. Bake at 450 for 8 to 10 minutes. Now, I may be wrong, and when our friend Susan listens to this podcast, she can correct me on the um, Miss Claire <laughs> Casseroles and Tacos Instagram post, but I remember them being folded over. So um, I don't know if she rolled them out and then 
you know, folded them over on the sheet or not. I'm not quite sure about that, but nevertheless, you'll still have the dough and it'll taste the same. Bake at 450 for eight to 10 minutes. And then she makes this note. Now, grandma would do the ending a little different. She would put them in the oven to cook until just set. Then she would take them out, let them cool and put them in the freezer. This way she could fix them at the first of the week and have a tray of fresh rolls ready to go in the oven with any meal or when one of the grandkids like me came begging. This recipe yields about three dozen rolls. And there you have a heritage recipe from our friend and listener to this podcast, Susan Cook Ragsdale of um, Middle Tennessee and her grandmother's uh, grandmother Claire cooks rolls. Now, Miss Claire is from Canadian uh, ancestry. So that's a little bit of interest, interesting information there. Um, so, but yeah, she was a great cook, great hostess, and they were just a, an adorable couple. And I appreciate them so much. Thank you, Susan, for sharing that with us. So, Andrea, Absolutely. maybe you can, um, I don't know, Maybe this fall you can try that. <laughs> Get away from that hundred and yeah, seven yeah. degree heat, you know? Yeah, absolutely not gonna be turning on the oven anytime soon. However, I am dying for the heat to drop down because now I gotta try these rolls. I love that they have such a rich legacy and that you both remember them and who knows oh, absolutely. how many countless people remember them um from their childhood or their even their adulthood. I just think that's so precious, so sweet. Um I love that that uh, Susan, thank you for taking the time to send that because I love that we get to share those little tidbits. I think that's so amazing. I, mm -hmm. I love when there's a recipe that that um, people become known for, right? The things oh, yeah. that, you know, when, when you talk about someone who's gone and you think, oh, do you remember her, mm. you know, blueberry cobbler? Don't do you remember her pumpkin bread? Whatever it is, you know, I love that there's those things that stick and kind of help the memory live on. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I could go on and on talking about them, um, that couple. But yeah, her, I remember uh, the role. I mean, that's just what, bless her heart. I wonder if there were times when she thought, glory be, I wish I didn't have to make one more batch of these rolls. Because, you know, every single solitary event and we never got tired of it and it was expected. So, you know, I'm glad she persisted Aww. and just kept on and... um made that turned out those rolls for us so she she um yeah. kept the all brand people in business i guess but yeah <laughs> yeah they were wonderful they were wonderful oh so i would love for uh, you know some more um listeners to share their stories andrew wouldn't that be awesome and it would be awesome to have them from different parts of the nation <laughs> yeah, you know so true. just um, i would love that i would too i would too so they can they can get in touch with us and share those i think if you guys don't start reaching out i'm gonna start calling you out by name i'm just gonna pick people out of yeah. a crowd i'm so okay you you Go. and you are assigned this week I'll put right. you in the spotlight <laughs> <laughs> yeah be like yeah. when you're in school if somebody doesn't answer i'm gonna yes. call on someone well, call on you. well that's what i do at my house you know <laughs> i say all right who's gonna do the so-and-so chore and everybody sits there and i said i'm about to pick somebody and I don't know what, what that does to make them volunteer, but somebody usually volunteers. So, and this week it has been, uh, cleaning, um, baseboards, which they thought that was fun. I mean, I don't, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, we're getting our house ready to sell. So, um, right. it's a week away from the taping, like a week or so from tonight, week about, I don't know, eight days, nine days. Remember, I don't wow. do math on days that end with why, but, um, <clears throat> right. Yeah, so we've had all that cleaning going on. So yeah, we we had uh, they volunteered to do baseboards, and well, they kind of halfway volunteered. I helped them volunteer because you know I don't want to get all the way down there. I told them I will do the ceiling fans. I'll clean ceiling fans, light fixtures. You guys do baseboards, so they did, and I tried to make it fun, and you know um, we worked on that. But the windows, we had to have the windows cleaned. I mean, I, we had somebody to come in, and um, now. You know, if, if you're one of those who ha regularly has somebody to come in, that's fine. But I'm not, and I'm not familiar with that practice of having somebody regularly come in. So he had to, uh, he's booked. I mean, the guy that I called, he was booked through August. And he was recommended to me. And he actually goes to our church, but I didn't know him. And our church is huge. And he was a great guy. He said, okay, let me try to work my schedule around. And he did. I'm so thankful for that. Um 
But he said, you know, people call me and it's an emergency and they realize they're having a party and their windows are dirty. And I thought, oh, bless. Okay, well, I'm not that person. <laughs> but I mean, if people do that, that's fine. But, you know, I live in a different world and, and I don't, I'm not familiar with that practice. But uh, he came in, great guy, did a great job. And um, <clears throat> he told me, we talked a lot about, we talked about food and we talked about all kinds of things. And it all started because I asked him if he wanted a SCOBY. I've got these SCOBYs and I don't, I, you know, you know, I can't, I, I just, I'm not in a position where I can make that right now and I can't take it with me on the RV. I mean, I, maybe I could, right. but I just needed to sh share the SCOBYs. <laughs> And he said, no, no, no. But he started talking about um, all kinds of food and foods he makes and fermenting he does and yogurt making and so forth. Well, this is fascinating. And I couldn't wait to share it with you, Andrea. So hold on. Let's listen. OK, he told me that he makes his kraut and all kinds of ferments. He even showed me on Amazon, on his phone, on Amazon, what book he bought um, to you know, learn how to ferment foods. And it's a cookbook. I don't remember. I think, well, it seems like the name of it was fermented foods, but that's really generic. So I don't know. But he said <clears throat> that it has a fermented food recipes from all over the world. And he made, uh, he's made different ones that he loved, but he made this one and, um, it uh, was uh, it was from Africa. That were the recipe derived from Africa, and it. I think he said it had beets, and then it, he said it had something else, and I don't remember what it was, but it did not sound at all like it would complement beets. Anyway, shredded beets and other things. Well, he didn't care for it, but he said he has this African American friend who's like a brother to him. The, the guy I'm talking about was a white guy, and so <clears throat> he said that. The the uh, friend contacted him. They were just talking one day and the friend said, hey, man, I'm doing um, paleo diet. And they were just chatting about that. And the uh, Keith, that's the window washer guy. Keith said, um, hey, you know, I've got several ferments. I just want you to try some. You know, I'll, I'll give you several ferments. So he got seven different ferments that he'd been working on, one of which and only one was that recipe that came from that cookbook that had derived out of Africa. He gave them to the friend, didn't tell him which is which or whatever. He just gave them to him. And the friend contacted him later and he said, oh, you know, thank you for the ferments and I loved them. But he said, my very, very favorite was that purple one, which ended up being the one that the African recipe. So... <clears throat> That captivated me, and I was like, wait a minute. I mean, the guy was African-American, and he was drawn, out of all seven of those ferments, he was drawn to the one that, the recipe that had derived out of Africa. And <clears throat> that made me think, whoa, wait a minute. I wonder if DNA has anything to do, or if your, you know, your genetics and your, your ancestry has anything to do with your tastes, your likes, and your dislikes of foods. Right. So have you ever heard of anything like that, Andrea? I mean, are you, have, I mean, that, that just no, seemed, I, to, seemed fascinating to me. It is. It is fascinating, but I have never heard of that specifically, but I, it's interesting to me, the things that have carried through my family, more dislikes than things that we're drawn to, but the dislikes have carried. And it's not just okay. like, because we've said, you that's gross and everybody agrees with you. It's like people that I didn't even spend a lot of time with growing up. It's like our whole family dislikes certain things. Okay. Um, so I don't know, maybe if the palate is affected somehow, I don't know. That's interesting. Well, it is. And so like many things in my life, I thought I had an original idea right? Until I go exploring and then you know, <laughs> bombed out. Kind of like the RV full time, you know, but I don't get out much, I guess. But um, so <laughs> that's what I did. I went on the internet and explored and sure enough, y'all, sure enough, I've got some papers in front of me. I had jotted down some notes and I want to share those because <laughs> I just think this really? is fascinating. This is, it's a real thing. Absolutely. It is a thing. That's amazing. <clears throat> so, you know, if it had been 1929 and the man had told me this, Katie would have been the one to discover this um, little, you know, phenomenon. But as it is now, 
alas, Arthur Fox decided, or he discovered it in 1931. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I have got, I went on smithsonianmag.com and um, I'm just going to paraphrase, but this is where I got my, the first part of my information. And so <clears throat> Arthur Fox was, the, was this researcher, and I'm really dumbing it down, y'all. So if you are a, you know, researcher or geneticist or whatever, then please forgive me. <clears throat> so Arthur Fox had this powder, and he blew some in the air intentionally or accidentally, and his um, <clears throat> co-worker tasted sweetness in his mouth and Arthur tasted nothing. And so he was like, wait a minute, why, why are we, you know, receiving this in two different ways, the sweetness or no taste at all. And that's what started the whole discovery or the whole, you know, research about this. So 1931, and I don't know in what country, cause I didn't find that <clears throat> information, but it did say in the article, the Smithsonian article, the way we perceive some flavors is coded in our DNA. So, hey, you know, the little ferment story um, has some truth to it. And um, so, yeah. uh, And let's see. What else did I find out? Oh, in discovermagazine.com, I was reading, and it's called Nutrigenetics. Okay. Now, I may be behind the times. Y'all may know all about this. But if you don't, please let me help you understand. And it says, (laughs) it says, um, Let's see. It says, I'm quoting, understanding the way our genes affect our choice of foods and our body's ability to process these foods is nutrigenetics. Researchers believe the studies could contribute to personalized diets that make healthy foods tastier by catering to people's preferences. And so they found out some Italian researchers were performing. um, This is after the Arthur Fox 1931 thing. This is more recent. Italian researchers performed a genome-wide uh, association studies, GWAS, to locate the specific genes responsible for certain food preferences. So a GWAS identifies variants within snippets of your DNA, and they get that from blood or from a cheek swab, um, that are linked to certain traits in groups of individuals. Um Now, I'm going to read you the foods. This was kind of interesting, too. So the foods that they found um, that 17 genes were linked to these foods um, that uh, the the genes affected people's affinity for these particular foods that I'm going to mention. All right. And you might be surprised that certain foods aren't in the list. I bet you will be. Okay. Number one is artichokes. There are three genes that affect whether or not you are going to like artichokes. All right. Uh, Bacon. I mean, hello. I mean, there's a group of people that doesn't like bacon. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that was the thing. Um, Broccoli. (laughs) There are two genes that affect whether or not you like broccoli. So Hmm. there you go. Coffee. Chicory. Mm. dark chocolate, blue cheese. I can kind of see that one because, you know, a lot of people don't like blue cheese. I don't have that gene. I know. Ice cream, uh, liver, butter or oil on bread, orange juice, plain yogurt, white wine, and mushrooms. So there are 17 genes that affect whether people like or don't like those particular foods, according to discovermagazines.com, discovermagazine.com's huh. article. So, um, so yeah, I just found that so interesting. And um, then I went on to um, newsmedical.net, and it says that um, I learned what super tasters are. Have you ever heard of that? I had never. Uh yeah, but I want oh, to hear it. Oh, okay. you have? I want to hear it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I just learned that some people are highly sensitive to, to sweet or to bitter foods, and those people are called super tasters, and it has something to do with um, the taste buds on on the tongue. And and there's some test that involves blue food color, and then if you're really interested, you can go search for it on the Internet because I didn't bother to, to write that down. But And it did say. I think. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I was going to say, I think I'm a super taster. Oh, do you? Okay, why? 
Yeah, I really do. I really think I am. You can do that. Go, go. When we hang up, go I want search to the blue food coloring. It's something, about, it was simple, but I didn't write it down. Something about putting blue food coloring on your tongue and then swish your mouth out with water, spit out, and then you just look at your tongue and you can somehow determine if you are based on oh, it's raised or not raised or so. I don't know. Go, please oh. report back and let us know if you're a super taster. Why do you think you are? Yeah. I mean, because I have an incredibly sensitive palate, like incredibly. And I think my cousin does too. So I wonder if there's like, and my brother, in fact, my brother is a winemaker and is known for his palate. And I think huh. um, like he gets hired to be, um, what is that called? What's the word? It starts with a C that slipped my mind just now. Oh, I don't know. A consultant. He's been hired oh, oh, as a oh. consultant for certain people just to taste the wine for them. Oh, Like that's how intense his palate is so um and uh, genetically like i think it's a thing in our family and so i've always felt like there's something i don't want to say not right because it works in our favor i think it does make us better cooks but i think it's um something's i i definitely think there's something to that and i'm now i want to i got to look up the test i got to find out i know you guys are all hanging on this cliffhanger i know you're all just like dying to find out if i'm a super taster Please, <laughs> is she or is she but, not? We need some kind of dramatic music right now. Um, yeah, done, hey, done. Well, so and rest today. assured, I'll tell you next time. Please, oh, please. Oh, relieve us of our misery so we can sleep. Uh, no, seriously, no, for real, though. That's interesting because I'm just yeah. learning all this, and I didn't even know you knew this. So uh, it is genetic. I did read that. So I wouldn't be so surprised. I mean, you're talking about your different family members. But no, for real, yeah, you though, know, I, I do want to know. Go, please yeah. do the test. and and. Um, I will. And let us know. Curious. Um, okay. Now, my last note on the super taster notes, it said children who are super tasters. Now, you tell me if this was you as a child. Might uh-huh. might choose sugary drinks in preference to, um, over water or milk, if given the choice, obviously, uh, due to taste preferences. Because um, water and milk don't do it for them. I mean, you know, it's bland. So given the choice, you know. Some people don't give their cho- children choice of sugary drinks, but given the choice, a super taster child would choose a sugary drink. So was that, do you think that was you as a child? No, that was Gavin though. Hmm. And what's interesting though, is I'm actually put off by things that are too sweet because everything tastes, okay. and Piper's this way, everything tastes too sweet to Piper. And it, okay. it can have no sugar in it and she thinks it's too sweet. Okay. Well, I did read another article and I didn't write down where I read it, but um, they did a, um, a stevia test and exactly what you're talking about. Like, um, the same amount of stevia, two different people, a super taster, a non super taster. And then in the one, it was, um, I guess in these, in the non super taster, I guess it would have been sweet. And then, then I guess in the super taster, it would have been bitter. Isn't that how it would be? Because oh, I mean, if you I use see. too much stevia, it is bitter. I can't stand stevia because it tastes so funny to me. Okay. But that's interesting. That's interesting. Now I'm kind of wondering about Gavin more the other way because they're saying super taster would taste sweet appropriately, but too sweet would be bitter. And to me, too sweet is just, I mean, I, I'm extremely sensitive to sugar. So I don't know if it's mm-hmm. that I miss my, my, like my palate misinterprets it or if I'm just put off by too much sweetness. Piper's the same way, but Gavin, mm-hmm. I swear nothing could be too sweet for that boy. Nothing. And he's always been that way. Okay. But you know what's interesting? You mentioned all those foods. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm going to have to do the test to satisfy my own right. curiosity. But you yes. mentioned all those foods. And I'm really surprised that they did not include cilantro in the study because there is oh, a oh, genetic oh. Hey, thing. I'm interrupting. No, it's a thing. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. People hate cilantro. Trinity it's a has genetic that gene. thing. Oh, my yeah, God. It tastes like soap. Yeah, Trinity, exactly it tastes like soap. And you, okay, I'm getting excited now. Uh huh. I read that. <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, it's real. I don't do research, so you can tell this is a rare phenomenon that I even research. Oh, no, I'm a researcher. It's my problem. Yes, I wrote. I read on there that people, I interrupted you, I'm sorry, that people say no, cilantro fine. tastes like soap. Mm-hmm. And one lady, I made this note in case we needed it, and I'm going to use it right here. One lady commented down below. She said, um, is there a thing for people who, you know, is it such a thing that people think cilantro tastes like soap? And another lady come in and said, absolutely. My daughter and I did, and I'm not endorsing this website. I'm just telling you what the lady said. She said, my daughter and I used 23andMe, like the number, the numeral two and three, 23andMe.com. Mm-hmm. And she, the lady said that she used that website to find out their um, DNA and so forth. And, as a result of that, they found out that they had that gene that um, where the cilantro tastes like soap. So wow. that's interesting. It's a real yeah. thing. 
It is a thing. Yeah, that's it's my a Trinity. genetic thing. Yeah, Trinity Wait, can't. Wait, so do it. you put she do you put cilantro in your um, pico or I use I mean Celine, a she'll I don't know. She, she's sitting right here. Trinity, shake your head. Do you like my salsa or do you taste the cilantro? You taste the cilantro. Or you like it. She likes it. I don't know. Maybe it covers oh, up. But if I put like it plain on something. Okay. She, mm -hmm. and also Trinity's palate is not super sensitive. It's funny the things that like, she'll eat things even if she doesn't like them. Cause she just sees food as fuel a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she's one of those that's like, Oh, I'll just eat it. Even if I'm not crazy about it. But if I put fresh cilantro on her food, just like on her tacos or whatever, she's like, and you just made it a soap taco. Like she just like, soap taco. <laughs> yeah. She's not a fan. She, okay. and me, I put it on everything. I, when you guys see my pictures on Instagram of my food and it's sprinkled with cilantro, uh -huh, I promise uh -huh. you that's either my, right. it's my plate because Art doesn't like it either. He's not crazy about cilantro. It doesn't taste like soap to him, but he just says it tastes gross. So, he, and maybe it that does taste like soap and he just hasn't identified it. Yeah. 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 It's really funny. Well, and, and you know, know, people like me have not grown up in the Mexican culture. So I mean yeah. this lovingly to you, but I mean, I, that's odd to me, you know, people of yeah. Mexican descent would not like it because I mean, I may, am I wrong? Yeah. I mean, it's used a lot in Mexican cooking, right? It's, and so, yeah, it's kind of like one of the primary. That, yeah, yeah. That's just fascinating that, hmm. Okay. Is there another you know that y'all don't, I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> the one through my family, my side of the family and my husband too, ironically, even though like we have no, we share no bloodline anywhere. Yeah, like, right, right. Obviously two different ethnicities, right. but he, um, we all, and not just in my house, but if you go through my family, it's like widespread and not just people. Cause I think sometimes you share dislikes cause ew, that's gross. Or we don't eat that. And so you're not used to it. Like I didn't grow up mm -hmm. eating mayonnaise. So I just didn't ever oh. develop a taste for it. Cause I just, we didn't eat it. My mom hates it. So we never ate it. So it wasn't until I was an adult that I even tried it. So, um, it's one of those, it's not like one of those things that it was environmental. If I talk to some of my family that I hardly ever saw and rarely ate with it's something that extends and that is mm -hmm. raw onion i absolutely okay. if you asked me one food that i hate mm -hmm. and that's a strong word yeah it's yeah, raw it onion is. and i do use raw onion i like the flavor it's not the flavor it's the same for raw onion as it is for watermelon for me it's mm. the texture i can't get past the texture when i bite into a raw onion and all that uh, no I can't handle it. And I, I like, it's instant. And my brother and I are the same way. It's literally instant rage. Like we completely oh hulk goodness. out. You're yeah, serious. It's like, you just this. like, I absolutely hate it. Katie. Oh. Like I can't even explain to you. So my brother's oh. worse than me. He, if he bites into something and it has an onion in it, he, he's like, Is he, gonna he spit hulks it out? out. It's, oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Oh, it's, oh. it's a literal hulk out. Okay. Oh, yeah. So like, oh. for example, let me give you an example. We've oh. talked about Taco Bell on the show before. And my love for Taco Bell. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. I don't eat there very often, but when I do, uh, it's like those Dos Equis commercials. I don't always eat Taco Bell, but when I do, yeah, um, right. I order the same thing I've ordered for 25 years. That's how that sentence ends. And uh -huh. it's always bean burrito, no sauce, no onions, emphasis on the no onions. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it's not because I don't like sauce. It's because I don't like their mild sauce. And I want the hot sauce on the side uh -huh. because the mild sauce is gross, but the hot sauce is good. Okay. Uh -huh. Raw, okay, if I bite into that burrito, which nine times out of 10, I will open it and check it first. And my husband laughs at me. He's like, you're going to check your burrito? Of course I'm going to check my burrito. Yeah, so, I, I don't blame you there. I mean, yeah, you never know. So if I bite into that burrito and I bite into an onion, like I'm getting stressed out just talking about it. Oh, and boy, my brother and sister and I, no, 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 my brother and sister and I, exact same, like we will have the exact response, all three of us. It's irredeemable. Katie, it's irredeemable. I am not going to just pick it out and eat another bite because I already know where there's one, there's two. And so if I bit into that one rogue onion that's hanging out in my burrito and rogue. I throw it away and I take another bite, I'm going to find its friend. I that's what's going to happen. Are. You are. And it's irredeemable. It's going in the trash. And that $1.49 down the drain. Right. Because Lord right. knows I'm not going to um, complain. I won't take it to the counter and tell him it's messed up. I just order another one. Right. But hmm. it's... uh. No, that's like the fastest way to make me turn bright green and okay. muscly is like, I'm yeah, um, onions. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm that way with celery and I don't know why I've tried to figure that out. I've tried to figure out, 
okay, what is hmm. it? Is it the is it the strings? Which I really think it's the strings. But I personally could string, you know, what I'm saying, string the celery or de-string yeah. or whatever it is, you know, take the um, knife and and get the strings off and stuff where it's nothing left but just the crunchy stuff. And still, I cannot get that near my mouth. Like my elbow won't move that way. And, um, and, you know, and my grandmother would stuff it with her homemade pimento cheese when I was a little girl. And so I would lick it out of the little or get it with my finger or my tongue. I can't believe she ate this after me. But anyway, I would <laughs> lick it or she would put stuff it with cream cheese and sprinkle it with paprika. She she did that sometimes. And I would lick out the insides and give her the celery and she would eat it. And that's gross now that I think about it. And I can't believe I just said that. But um, anyway... <laughs> I, I can't put celery near my mouth, but I have like when I was catering, um, you know, I, I put it in people's food the recipes, you know, that called for it. And I, I don't have a problem cutting it up or anything like that. Um, I just can't put it in my mouth. And um, but I have been I can stir fry it if I make sure there's no strings on it and I stir fry it like in my gumbo and I can eat it. But hmm. um so that's really the only food that I, um, I, I don't, I don't, I have been known to chew and swallow some X, you know, like I was trying to, you know, be a big girl and try to not spew it across the restaurant when I didn't realize that chicken salad had it in it or whatever. But oh. <laughs> I will ask, I'll say, you know, oh, can you tell me what's in your chicken salad? And invariably here, you know, it's pecans yeah. and celery. <laughs> Or grapes, yeah. but it's always has celery, and I'm thinking, oh, people. So yeah, yeah. celery is it for me. But um, you know, some some not in your case, I don't think, but of course, some like for example, on my whole family hates celery, and that's only because I just never cooked it, and I just threw such a fit about it that they decided they don't like celery. You know what I mean? So I don't yeah, think I, do. <clears throat> I don't think for us it's like a DNA thing; it's just an environmental thing. I have a theory um, about the onions, though. I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. No, I'm done. But I have a theory about the onions. This whole sensitive palate thing that we have, it goes back like at least two generations. And I only say at least because I don't know beyond that. I wasn't Mm -hmm. alive for anybody past, Mm -hmm. you know, two generations behind me. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone had a very sensitive palate. Not everyone, but the cookers in the family, so to speak, which is not a word. But you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like the, the people who were known for their food in the family mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all had a sensitive palate and were very vocal about the things they didn't like and the textures they didn't like. Okay. And so I kind of have a theory that it's because we have such sensitive palates that the burst of raw onion is just way too overpowering for us. I think it's like sensory overload okay. because it's just like too much to handle. But I do think there's something to it. Like, I think there's some things that are environmental, like the mayo is environmental because I don't dislike mayo. I had just never been exposed to it. Or like I told you guys last time, I had never been exposed to sweet tea. It's just not something I ever learned about. Right, right. But the onion thing is like such, it's almost like a primal response (laughs) that I feel like it goes back away. Like there's something to it genetically. So I don't know. This conversation is really interesting. It's making me wonder for sure. Also, just as a side note, Art absolutely detests celery. Um, and I'll put it in soups and stuff like for broth, but I have to fish it out because he says, why'd you put that dirt vegetable in there? Cause mm. he says it tastes like just straight dirt with water. He just oh, thinks no, it's I absolutely like the flavor disgusting. though. I'll buy it yeah. and, you know, wash That's it and won't even de-string it or whatever. <clears throat> and I'll put it, you know, if I'm doing broth, Oh, I don't, but I put the big old long thing in there. You know, I don't cut it up because I want to be able mm-hmm. to fish it out. And, well, that's um, what I do with onions. So, yeah, I cut them in I half like, and stick them in the pot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you don't mind touching them or whatever. You don't, you know. No, I like onions. them cooked. I don't like them cooked. Let me rephrase that. If you just gave me like caramelized onions, no ma'am. Um, mm. But if if they're like cooked down in something, I'm mm-hmm. okay with it. It's oh, if okay. they're still crisp. I can't do the crisp. That's why all my salsas, you guys, anyone who's followed me for any period of time knows that anything onion is in is in my blender first. Every single time. I will blend it to cook it. Yeah. So, you know, you just yeah. find ways. We're just going to adapt. Yeah. yeah. Adjust well, to our, our, our DNA. <laughs> it is. And, and, and in the SmithsonianMagazine.com website, it did say that nurture is just as important. And I think that's what you were talking about. You know, that's what you're talking about with mayonnaise, for example. And it goes on to say, yeah. I'm quoting, it says, over our lifetimes, we build many complex associations with flavors and scents that can override our DNA. So <clears throat> it gave the example of um, say, you, you know, you have the child who prefers the sugary drinks and in the same, um, 
test, they also had adults who had the super taster, you know, they were the super tasters, but they didn't choose the sugary drinks only because they had learned, you know, they had that learned behavior that the sugary drinks were not healthy and they made better choices. So they're just saying that the, um, you know, nurturing, nurture over nature kind of, kind of thing. Interesting. Um, I love it. Can, you know, override the, the DNA sometimes if you want it to. And if you don't want it to override the onion thing, hey, more power to you. But <laughs> if we're going to be friends, you're going to have to eat onions. <laughs> I, I mean, I knew that was this coming. Is, this is, you're going to have to, because we don't, it's a, it's a tragedy at our house if we run out of mayonnaise and people know it. When my um, first daughter-in-law, um, this may have been before she married my son. I don't know. But it's funny because um, for my birthday one year, she gave me, like, she went to the, one of these bulk food type place things and bought me a huge box, like a restaurant uses, of individual packs of mayonnaise. So she made sure I wouldn't run out of mayonnaise. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, yeah, you, you mentioned mayonnaise. I just had to throw in there how much I love mayonnaise. I mean, there, that there is are so- people in my hometown, people I grew up with who just know Katie and her mayonnaise. So I don't know why I'm not a ketchup lover and I'm a, you know, mustard, meh, whatever I take it, leave it. But mayonnaise, mm. I mean, you can make horseradish sauce for mm. um, roast beef sandwiches and you, okay, well we'll stop there, but oh yeah. Um, that's fascinating stuff. It's interesting it. stuff. So lots of fun well, information, it. but it's help. It's, it's interesting. You know, so come yes. back next week, next time, next time we record, you you let us know about your blue dye test. I'm not going to let you forget our blue <laughs> food coloring test. I guess you'll have to go That's buy amazing. some, won't you? Because you don't have any. Yeah, I will. Around, do you? No, I don't. I just use the last of it on a craft, but I uh, definitely need to go get some because now you're, I'm reading, you read more of it. I'm thinking, oh, maybe that's Gavin. Maybe that, I don't know. Now I'm going to, everyone's going to have blue teeth in my family. So thank you, Katie. And uh, sure, <laughs> sure. Happy to be of service. I love it. And thank you guys for joining us for a science day over here at Casseroles and Tacos. We really appreciate you joining us and learning about all the different aspects of food in the kitchen and, yeah. and life. And just sharing interesting stuff. So thank you for joining us. We hope that you guys will connect with us over on Instagram. Tell us if you think you're a super taster. Because I'm curious. Yes. I want to know if anyone else does the blue dye test. Let's she doesn't want to be alone. alone. Here. She doesn't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. So Mm-mm. I'm going to need all the Smurf tongues yes. to come out and uh, share their story too. So find us over on Instagram at Casseroles and Tacos. And again, if anyone has any kitchen legacy stories to share, please email us casseroles and tacos at gmail.com. Or like I said, I'm going to start calling on folks. So you guys have a good one. Thank you for joining us. And we will catch you next time. Have a good one. See you later. I'm going to Taco Bell and getting a burrito. <laughs> no onions. <laughs>